this talk is based on work done partly in collaboration with Eugenio Proto, who will be the next speaker, and uh, Federica Liberini, who is one of our P PhD students. So, <coughs> Shayantan, mm, th this is what the title is about at the session. In the face of evidence, individuals may lack coherent or stable preferences. Is there a case of using happiness data to underpin economic policy? Actually, in connection with that, I would like to say that even if individuals did have coherent or stable preferences, there may still be a case for using happiness data. After all, if you go back and follow seriously the Bentamite tradition of pleasure versus pain, I mean, he didn't really talk about preferences. And another reason for perhaps being interested in happiness data is that a long-standing problem in welfare economics and in social choice theory has been what's usually called interpersonal comparisons of utility. Actually, the way I would prefer to think about that is trying to construct an interpersonally comparable measure of utility. That's a big problem. Um, anyway, so large-scale survey panel data, individual subjective well-being is typically regressed and there's some issues about that too because subjective well-being uh, you usually asked on a scale of 1 to 10 or something like that how, uh, how satisfied are you with your life for many different variations on that question and it's not at all clear that this gives you uh, what the utility theory we would call a cardinal measure of utility, one that could be added, subtracted, and so on. And of course, if you're going to run linear regression equations, you're typically looking at the mean level of well-being among a certain group and how that relates to income. Well, the mean requires some cardinal measure. Much of what I'm going to say today actually is only going to presume some kind of ordinal measure, that if somebody reports a higher measure of well-being, that presumably is better, or if people of a certain kind are more likely to report higher levels of well-being. So correlation is actually positive association, and uh, the number of concerns, which I will then try and deal with. Um, no, I think I just used this. Okay, so let's start with four income distributions. And uh, I'm going to say more in a little bit about how they relate to each other. So a survey, <coughs> the, the data we use is from a world value survey. Five waves, lots of observations. And the key variable, which I'm going to report in a moment, is yearly individual income measured in year 2000 US dollars. So, um, <coughs> uh, what, typically, the way uh, people report their income, they report where their income lies in a certain interval. Um, so, the lower and upper bounds transform to individual in, uh, to annual income because often it's monthly or weekly income and then uh, an interval regression was used to estimate a probability distribution of possible income for each interviewee and uh, the other thing that's important is to correct for exchange rates and price changes so it's always reduced to year 2000 US dollars using some measure of purchasing power parity. Federica was kind enough to attend to all those details. So here's one income distribution. So we've got yearly individual income measured on a logarithmic scale so this is $1,000 a year. So the people who are on 
$2 a day or less are down here, several of them $1 a day and so on. And we've gone up to about $200,000. That's a lot of income. One of the 1%, right? Not the 99%. And on this axis, of course, the cumulative frequency. So that's the cumulative distribution function of income of these blue people. I'll tell you in a moment what it takes to be a blue person. Green people. Again, I'll tell you in a moment what it takes to be a green person. Two income distributions, the blue and the green. What's noticeable here is what we would call stochastic dominance. This curve, the green curve, lies entirely to the right of the blue curve. So if you look at any income level, like $1,000 a year, then the proportion of people with incomes below $1,000 a year is higher on the blue curve than on the green curve. So the blue curve is clearly a worse income distribution than the green distribution. The green distribution, people have more incomes in a sense of stochastic dominance. Yellow. Red. Four together. Blue, green, yellow, and red. Always shifting up. Blue to green, yellow, and red. Using the stochastic dominance test, shifting from one distribution to the next is always better. So who are these different people? Well, of course, the other thing the World Value Survey did, and the reason we use this data source anyway, is that they had people report a certain level of happiness. So blue people have a blue mood. <laughs> uh, green people <laughs> on the way. Yellow, quite happy. That's a, a, a plurality. And red for very happy. And what you see is that as you go from blue to red, we get this stochastic dominance relation. So why is this important? Well, it's quite interesting that you get stochastic dominance, but also I have to confess that I spent quite a lot of my life being rather skeptical about the value of surveys of well-being, and I guess I sort of got persuaded by this. I mean, maybe I could have been persuaded by regression tests as well, but this I thought was particularly persuasive that these reports of subjective well-being, I mean, if you ask me what's my well-being, I don't, I, I don't even, I'm not quite sure what the question means, actually. But whatever the question means, however people interpret it, it does seem as though the data is telling you something important. And that people who report higher levels of well-being have higher incomes on the, on the whole, in this narrow statistical sense. By the way, it's reassuring that it's not a tautology. So if you mismeasure income in a certain way, you will get crossing curves. So here the blue and green curves cross, the red and the yellow. I mean, not much, but there's some. And in some sense, we've mismeasured income here by uh, essentially ascribing to each person or each survey respondent in a particular country their national GDP per head. So we're, lump we're treating all individuals in the same country in the s at the same time as having the same income. So this is obviously a way of mismeasuring income, and if you do that, then this relationship is lost. So it's, a, it's an empirical law rather than a, a mathematical property theoretical property. 
which by the way, we've since looked at other data sets and it seems to be preserved if you do things properly. So why does this matter? What's going on and what should we do with the data? <clears throat> well, of course, there's a, a fairly large tradition in psychology, especially, um, concerning measurements of happiness and how to use them. So this is some of the early literature. I guess the term subjective well-being owes a lot to Dina. And uh, <coughs> that's one of the reasons why we've chosen that, that term. But something else that uh, prompted a lot of the interest in this among economists was, uh, involves actually some of my former Stanford colleagues. I, I suspect Easterlin was a PhD student there, but certainly Paul David, Moses Abramovitz I had the privilege to know as well. But anyway, the Easterlin hypothesis or the Easterlin paradox involved looking at US data during the early post-war period and it suggested that economic growth didn't appear to enhance subjective well-being in the US population. Even though income per person rose steadily average reported happiness showed no long-term trend and may actually have de declined during the 60s, which was the most recent decade for which he had uh, data. And of course, Abramovitz was a historian of economic growth and I think was always of the view that growth was going to be beneficial, whereas uh, another of the people I New York Stanford Tibor Skutovsky wrote about the joyless economy, suggesting that growth and so on need not necessarily bring about well-being in various ways. So is it relevant? Well, much more careful studies have suggested that if you do things properly, then on the whole, changes in happen the changes in income lead to changes in uh, <coughs> reported happiness. Uh, but there's al it's always tends to be with reference to some sort of baseline, a historical average. So it's not too surprising, actually, that after a time, even if you had a big pay rise last year, that's, that's good. That, for you, your, um, makes you more likely re to report being well off for a while, but then you get accustomed to your new standard of life. Maybe you took out a huge mortgage and so on, <laughs> so that might actually make you worse off. So there's some adjustment. It's certainly complicated. Uh, but does the data really matter? Does, is this data which we should use? So uh, Abramovitz might have been thought as saying, well, we should simply pursue growth anyway. Uh, subjective well-being measures, who cares? Um, we've got better opportunities to pursue happiness, even if we don't achieve it, better opportunities to pursue happiness, and that's fine. So income growth and wealth accumulation are somehow in, in, inherently desirable, and uh, empirical analysis of social well-being has no normative significance. That's another possible claim. Kuznets. Actually, Kuznets, perhaps the father of GDP measurement, in 1934, <coughs> the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measure of national income. So already Kuznets had skepticism. And another normative extreme is to concentrate simply on subjective well-being. And, uh, well, 06, 81% of Britain's population would rather the government made them happier than richer. <laughs> 
So Easterlin's paradox suggests we should not even try to promote growth or development because it doesn't necessarily make people happier. By the way, part of why I got interested in this was uh, it involved a, a World Bank conference and the sort of corollary of this would be, well, the World Bank <laughs> shouldn't, shouldn't, has no raison d'etre. <laughs> so. so a few years ago, the marginal utility of income. Richard Layard, who um, perhaps rather actively promotes happiness as an objective of economic policy, well, Guy, Guy Meiras and Stephen Nichol had a paper which they called The Marginal Utility of Income, in which they estimated an equation, H for happiness or subjective well-being, regressed on the utility of income, which they want to use to come up with a marginal utility of income, plus various linear terms, x is a vector of other observable individual characteristics that may be relevant to both individuals' reports of their own subjective well-being and social value judgments. And what did they do with their results? Well, actually, first of all, they, they took a particular measure of utility, constant elasticity of uh, marginal utility with respect to income. <coughs> uh, I guess this should be the derivative of the uh, logarithm of marginal utility with respect to income. I'm sorry, there's a typo there, marginal utility. Uh, the parameter A is then the Atkinson measure of constant relative inequality aversion. Uh, more people know about the constant absolute uh, relative measure of risk aversion. Well, this is an analogy when you're not concerned with risk so much as inequality. And they called this uh, the marginal utility of income. But let me suggest that it's not... It, we have to be careful what this really means. What it actually describes is a marginal happiness or psychological marginal utility. In other words, you're using empirical data to come up with some estimate of a marginal, but marginal what? It's not necessarily the utility that you need for normative analysis of economic policy. It's more a measure of how willing, how uh, people's reported satisfaction responds to their income. So descriptive rather than a prescriptive measure. And the importance, the, the distinction between the two is, I think, uh, rather important in the tradition of what philosophers call Hume's law, the need to distinguish an ought from an is. Is statements descriptive? Ought statements prescriptive. The two are not the same, and you should be careful in jumping from one to the other. So, uh, the, the point this marginal utility function need not be the same as an ethical marginal utility of income. And they talk about their measures being important for cost benefit analysis, optimal taxation, and so on. And I don't think they've made the case. Because if it were so, you've got this extra prescriptive hypothesis. The claim has to be that uh, your social welfare function is, should be the total of uh, the expected measure of subjective well-being conditional on... Um, so this is the terms in the sum. That's the expected value of I's reported subjective well-being, HI, conditional on the things that you can perhaps vary, their income, YI, and XI, a vector of other characteristics, which may or may not be influenced by policy. YI, you do expect to be influenced by economic policy. So they are leaping from these reports of subjective well-being to a very specific functional form, 
which is really based on conditional means of people's reported subjective well-being. And it's leaping from description and regression results to prescription in a way it's not clearly justified. So that is a strong prescriptive hypothesis which we should perhaps question. So the title of this talk, Social Choice and Individual Reports of Subjective Well-Being, is chosen because I want to link this work to literature and social choice which in some sense emanates from Kenneth Arrow's monograph in 1951, Social Choice and Individual Values. Now, that monograph is well known for presenting us with the Arrow impossibility theorem that says that if you try and have a social choice rule, which respects some um, nice conditions like unrestricted domain, independence of irrelevant alternatives, and a Pareto rule, you have a dictatorship. So the impossibility theorem says you can't avoid a dictatorship. But what we learned in the 70s, largely from the work of Amartya Sen and others, was that really the informational framework that Arrow was willing to use is, is, uh, is impoverished, it's not rich enough, we need more information. And ideally, I suppose, we want the kind of information that we could use to make interpersonal comparisons. After all, an economic policy, it's very rare that we get a Pareto improvement where everybody is better off, or at least no one's worse off, some are better off. And by the way, even if that were true, we might question the, the preferences that were used to reach that uh, conclusion. But uh, most of the time, of course, uh, policies, there'll be winners and losers, and we have to see whether the gains of the winners outweigh the losses of the losers. And that involves fundamentally some sort of interpersonal comparisons. Are these persons' gains more important than those persons' losses? Of course, in the 30s and so on, Caldor and Hicks described compensation criteria on which you'd say that A is better than B if those who gained from a move from B to A could compensate those who lost. But there were all sorts of confusions, logical confusions, which emanated from that, those attempts. And there's also a fundamental ethical problem, because if you don't arrange the compensation, then the claim that A is better than B because of a compensation test, that claim seems to me ethically indefensible. And if you do arrange the compensation, then A is better than B under the Pareto test. So the compensation criterion doesn't really get you out of the problem, as Arrow himself actually emphasized. So, um, <coughs> so let's try to do a little social choice theory, but in a very different kind of setting from Arrow, in fact rather more closer in many ways to that of his uh, student, uh, John Hassani. So we have a fixed, a finite set of individuals, and we're going to think about social choice, but what's going to be important, uh, what helps things conceptually is, as in the theory of public goods, so if you're, we're thinking whether we should have um, a little more lighting or a little less lighting in this, in this room, it's a public good, public part of a public environment for this room, so you have a view perhaps about the lighting, I have, and so on. Everybody has their views about the lighting, 
And uh, so we imagine where a world where Eugenio can have his level of lighting, Shant and his, so all of us could have our own levels of lighting. What would be the lighting that we would want if we could choose our own level of lighting? Now, of course, we can't, if we're all in the same room, the lights are here for all of us, so there's a constraint that says we all have to have the same level of lighting. Well, in the same idea, when it's a social state, we each imagine we can have our own copy of a social state, and it's, that's going to be a personal consequence. An important idea also, due to Harsanyi and this connection, is looking at lotteries and von Neumann Morgenstern utilities, in effect. Life is full of risk and uncertainty anyway, but also Harsanyi had in mind that we should choose uh, for society as if we were behind, I'm going to say, the veil of ignorance, that is actually rules rather than Hassani, but with a big difference that rules have one view of what people would do behind this veil of ignorance, which I won't explain. Hassani had a different view. There's an equal chance of becoming any one person in the society, and we should choose as if we recognize those chances. So we deliberately put ourselves in a situation of uncertainty because we should be deciding as though we're not really sure who we're going to be. So we're going to have lotteries over social states, and social states list every individual's personal consequence. So for each individual, we look at their personal consequence, we look at the distribution of personal consequences, and we look at lotteries there. And if we all have to have the same lights in the end, that's a sort of constraint on our policy. And of course, each individual, we can look at the marginal distribution, in the probabilistic sense, of their consequences. We've got this two, three, high dimensional vector, and what each person I is interested in is their component, and the lottery on their component. Actually, that's the basic hypothesis of, okay, individualistic consequentialism, which I'll come to in a moment. So we're going to have, <coughs> we're going to assume that we're going to want to maximize the expected value of some welfare function on the space of consequence, um, uh, on the space of individualized social states. We have lotteries over these social states. We're going to want to maximize the expected value of a function w which depends on the entire profile of individual consequences, which represents a social state. Um, and, of course, we get cardinal equivalents to von Neumann Morgenstern utility functions. Their expected values will represent the same preferences if and only if they are cardinally equivalent. One function is related to another, by an additive constant plus a positive multiplicative constant. And uh, if you're going to look at rational policy choices in ethical decision trees of various kinds, then we should argue that our objective should take this form by the usual principles of normative principles of individual choice. So individualistic consequentialism says that what matters are marginal personal lotteries. And in particular, if all individuals have the same marginal lotteries, then that's, that's socially, we get social equivalence. So if we have two lotteries, lambda and mu, and for each individual, 
the marginal distribution lambda i equals the marginal distribution mu i, then the fact that lambda and mu may involve different correlations between different individuals is judged to be, well, I'm going to say inconsequential. Shouldn't matter. It's not a relevant difference in the consequences one faces. That's one assumption. Another assumption is that we're going to base our policy on what matters to individuals. And what matters to individuals is presumably their personal lottery. So for each individual, we should have an ethical rule, our ethical rule that says, should say something like this. If only individual I, if we imagine a social choice which affects only one individual, then we should make, the way we make those choices in one person situations defines actually a, a concept of individual welfare. That is the concept of individual welfare we should be using. What it is right to be chosen when only one individual is affected by the policy. What do you mean by an individual lottery? It seems pretty fundamental to what you're saying. So, uh, uh, okay. So a lottery... I know a lottery. Yes, yeah, so, pr well, so the prizes come out at random, but there are... So we're going to have different coloured... Uh, so, so we can imagine balls with numbers, and there might be blue balls which describe what you're going to get and red balls which describe what somebody else is going to get. Or we might have balls which have a blue side and a red, so a blue half and a red half. The blue half will have one number, a red half will have another number. So it's some randomization process which determines, if you like, each person's incomes or other economic consequences. So you, you, you could get, referring back to your life preferences, you, you would get allocated essentially randomly a, a, a draw from the distribution of preferences for lighting in the room. You get a... So if we come back to the lighting example, we would have a, a random process to determine the level of lighting. Well, so that was a case where there was one thing that affects us all, but when we come, we also get to look at, of course, where different, indiv can I give it income, is a personal consequence. So different individuals get different incomes drawn at random. Now that's a little too simple because we may care, it, it may be relevant how much inequality there is in the society you live in, in which case that becomes like lighting, something which affects us all. These consequences could be enormously rich. Does that help? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. So what does this assumption mean? That We're going to choose the right choices for society are the right choices for the individuals in the society. And those right choices for individuals depend on just varying one consequence at, at a, uh, one person's consequence at a time. Well, <coughs> under those assumptions, individualistic consequentialism that only individuals' marginal lotteries matter, and individual welfareism, that for each individual there is a, a function which des determines what is the right thing to do if only that person is affected, then you can argue that this, f this theorem that says 
this social von Neumann Morgenstern utility function, whose expected value should be maximized, is going to be the sum of suitably measured individual functions. And sometimes we're going to say that these functions for individuals depend on certain types, Ti. Okay, so what does this have to do with subjective well-being? Well, there's quite a lot of subtlety here which may be missed. Um, at least if, remember, I said that all that you can tell about from really uh, some subjective well-being, perhaps, is that higher is better. You can't tell that an, in that an increase from six to seven is half as good as an increase from six to eight. Maybe that's true, but maybe it's not. That would be an additional assumption. So to see how careful we must be, let's start off with a simple case where we have a two-point scale. Satisfied or dissatisfied with life. Zero, one, one, huh. all right, that's it. That's, uh, that's all you can say. And you observe for each individual consequence, which may include income and other family circumstances, and maybe a type as well, you observe the proportion who report being satisfied. So, simple measure of subjective well-being reported on a two-point scale. Already, we may or may not be able to say some th things. It depends what we assume. Now, <coughs> so the, here's the question. Sorry, am I going? Yes, I want to go backwards. So presumably, if a larger proportion of people when faced with Z and T, report being satisfied, that is better. Let's start off with that view. And if we try and apply Arrow's ideas in this setting, we could make the value judgment that a higher P and a higher V are related. So what's the V? The V is the utility we're going to use and add up in order to make comparisons of social states. So uh, we could argue that higher P and higher V are associated. In which case there must be an increasing function. V and P must be related. Higher V implies higher P. But this increasing function can depend on the type of the individual, which may or may not be observable. And uh, <coughs> in that case, we know that our welfare measure is going to be the sum of transformations of these probabilities. And, uh, well, here's the problem. And since time is rapidly uh, going away, let me just say what, of course, the problem is. That you can say really very little about this sum unless you know much more about the transformations. So that if all you know is that V and P are ordinarily related, then <coughs> about all you can say 
on the uh, basis of this subjective well-being data on a binary scale is that if you make all classes of individuals report higher levels of subjective well-being on average, the, the, pro pro the proportions who report higher levels of subjective well-being, or sorry, one instead of zero, if that goes up, then that's a Pareto improvement. Um, so everybody is better off. So there's really no way, without further assumptions, of using subjective well-being data to reach any conclusions except those using the usual Pareto uh, criterion that if every, instead of saying if everybody prefers A to B it's better, what you can say is that every, if everybody has a higher probability of reporting being satisfied then that's better. That's all you can say. However, you could also use these measures of subjective well-being perhaps to use some interpersonal comparisons. So that you might say that if people like Shayantan were more likely to report being satisfied with life than people like Eugenio, then somehow Shayant people like Shayantan are better off. That introduces an interpersonal comparison, or at least between groups of people, and then you can apply a strengthening of the cri uh, Pareto criterion to one due to the philosopher Patrick Supers, and you can look at the proportions of individuals who report different levels of well-being. So it's not, see the Pareto criterion, you have to ask, does uh, <coughs> each individual have a higher pro propensity to report being satisfied as opposed to dissatisfied? Here, you can look at the proportions, the expected proportion of individuals with a personal consequence induces a probability of expressing satisfaction. <coughs> and you can use that uh, as, on, as a basis on which to make um, comparisons of policy. Well, that is with a two-point scale. Uh, you can go on and of course what's more interesting is to look at multi-person scales. Uh, so to conclude I'll just say a little bit about the ordered multinomial choice model where the subjective well-being level ra raises over a, a finite set maybe 0 to 10, and you look at the conditional probability of each type of individual reporting a so subjective well-being, and you're going to look at the <coughs> probability that an individual reports a subjective well-being level no lower than S. This is a downwardly accumulated uh, probability distribution. Um, so uh, higher values of P will be, will be better. And under various assumptions, this may be related to a stochastic utility function. And you may even have a relation to ordered logit and pro probit, so that you can then use the results of ordered probit regression results, um, you may be able to use them finally to make welfare judgments between different policies 
possibly based on interpersonal comparisons as well, but we still only have ordinal, ordinal measures. We still don't have the idea that an increase from three to five is twice as good as an increase from three to four. That may be true, but if it is true, it has to rely on some other much stronger value judgments which may or may not be related to whether people themselves think that they are reporting something on a cardinal scale. So, to conclude, of course, there's lots of work, which I guess we'll hear something about from Eugenio shortly, about regression results, where the dependent variable is subjective well-being. Those are psychologically interesting, possibly economically relevant, but it's still rather early days, I think, before we are, are uh, really sure what their policy implications should be, unless we are rather naive and simply say policies which include increase mean subjective well-being are definitely better. But that's a very strong value judgment, and I think we need to analyze it more carefully and understand it better. <laughs>